Hi, welcome to this Godocon presentation for The Garden Path. I'm Louis Durrant, developer of the game, and I thought I'd do a short presentation guiding you through the game's first moments, as they are now, and hopefully explain a little bit about how I built the game along the way. Here is our garden the game has generated for us from a series of possible chunks, or acres, of map. This starting chunk is shared by all games. Let's investigate this shrine first. As you can see in the top left, the game is adjusting itself according to the time in the real world. Here, the game is asking if we'd like to adjust time zones to the hour. Perhaps, for instance, you'd like to come home after work, but play as if it's daybreak in your garden. Well, we can set that up here. Now we've locked in that time. So while the game minute to minute reflects time in the real world, its seasons and years are much shorter and the game will never clock past its own year end should you just leave the game. Let's talk to our friend down here. This is Augustus. Alas, we're not a ranger. Now he's given us half a pair of sucker tours, which is generous but not particularly useful. He said he lost the other half, so perhaps we can go and look for them. Ah, this looks like the other half here. We'd better go and take them back to him just in case he wants them. Now he's very kindly offering to mend them for us. In return we can collect those bracken sprigs he's asked for. Now we've got the fixed sucker tours, we can go into our inventory and equip them. By pressing select on the gamepad or tab on the keyboard we can open the overview menu here and learn more about the item. We can also have a look at what else we have on us at the moment and check what errands we currently have. Now let's take out those sucker tours and start gathering those sprigs. Collecting is just a case of going up to the node that I want to harvest and pressing the use button. And I can also hold down the left trigger like this to slow the character down and select the node with a crosshair that pops up, useful for more dense areas. Our tools aren't going to break with use. Looks like someone else has visited our garden. It's Tom.
he's given us his old trowel. This will make it easier for us to plant seeds and improve the garden. The game uses a bartering system rather than a global currency. Each traveller values certain items differently. Now, acorns are easy to come by, but we don't have the tools to collect them at the moment. Um, it will be easy to trade these for something else. We can try giving him some of what we've collected while out gathering those sprigs. Factors like our relationship with the character, our charm stat for instance, uh, will play a role. But that did it, and now we can plant those seeds. Botanicals like these are more valuable, but later on we'll be able to brew them into a tea. Not only can we offer the tea to those living or visiting the garden, but depending on what we brew, we'll return different properties from the tea itself uh, when we drink it. Each item in the game is its own object class, so it can hold any number of different variables we give them. As such, two of the same item may actually be very different. The game doesn't use a grid, instead the garden path uses collisions to build the world. I think this helps make the world feel more natural and gives more freedom when it comes to where we want to plant these, for instance. Uh, we need to be careful not to plant them too close, however, um, it could stunt their growth down the line. So just like this should be fine. Depending on the soil in this part of the garden, they should grow into saplings in the next day or two. Let's head back to Tom. The map here helps alert us that something's happened elsewhere, so let's head over. And look, it says here we've unlocked a star. Stars are like achievements, but once we've unlocked enough, we can use them to form constellations that will have game-altering effects, like a night garden or faster-growing flowers, for example. But those are long-term goals. Let's get back to the garden. I'm currently using a DualShock 4 to play. You can use any gamepad, I imagine, although the game can also be played on a keyboard and mouse. Godot's animation blending here helps to make movement uh, really feel natural with the help of some specific character animations. Someone wants to live in our garden. It's Olga, she's an onion. She's visited us because of those seeds we grew earlier, and over time will attract different residents depending on how we grow the garden. I like Olga, so she can stay. I can talk to Olga, run errands for her, or later on uh, give her a task to work on in the garden. Maybe now's a good time to set up camp. I think this looks like a good spot. Pitching a tent should be as easy as just selecting an open area for it, like this. We can move the tent at any time, so long as we've cleared its interior. It looks good. Not much to do in here for now though, uh, we can start filling out this space once we acquire some items. And I think that's a good place to call it a day. Thanks for watching, I really hope you enjoyed what I was able to show you. Uh, the Garden Path is due to release later this year on PC, that'll be Windows, Linux and hopefully Mac OS too. Elsewhere I'll be answering questions about the game, how it works and how it was made. If you want, you can follow its progress by searching The Garden Path on itch.io joining reddit.com slash r slash the garden path or following me on twitter at louis Durant. thanks again and enjoy the rest of this year's godot con bye bye
Hello, I am Andrea and today I want to talk about ECS. Acronym of Entity Component System, ECS is not a recent technology, it's taking place slowly but inexorably. It's designed to process a big amount of data compared to object-oriented and in parallel, almost automatically. Games like Overwatch or game engines like Unity, Baby, Amethyst, Wicked Engine are specifically designed with an ECS core. I am developing an ECS module for Godot, with the aim to implement deeply as I need to not make it second to any engine already designed with ECS in mind. The module is called Godex, let's give it a check. My testing scene is composed by two types of elements, the breeze that runs around the center, random teleport nodes that teleport to a new random place each frame. There is a spawner that spawns the Godot scenes or the Godex entities. Both does the, the exact same thing, but in different ways, of course. Left side, Godot is running around 40 frames per second with 10,000 nodes, while Godex is running at 60 frames per second, which is running 1.5 times faster. Since the rendering is a bottleneck in this scene, the difference is not much, but if we compare the poor processing algorithm, things change. Just by removing the mesh instance on the Godot scene and the mesh component on the entity, we can suppress the rendering and so the bottleneck. Godot is able to handle around 220,000 nodes at 30 fps, while Godex is able to handle a million of entities, which is near to 5 times better at the same frame per second. ECS achieved this by grouping the data by type and not by object. When you compose a node in Godot using object-oriented, all the characteristics of the node are stored altogether. These nodes are then stored in the memory not continuously, and each frame the CPU jumps from one memory position to the other, executing always a different piece of code. On top of this, due to the object-oriented encapsulation mechanism, the node handles all its logic by itself, so it has to access other nodes' data. Just think about your get node in your code. For the CPU, this means access random position data. This overhead slows down the execution. With ECS, the data is grouped by type in separate storages. Differently from a node, an entity is just a bare element without a predefined behavior. The associated data, called components, are processed regardless of the meaning you give to such entity. So you can have a debris with both transform component and velocity component, but also a bullet or even a character with such components. At the same time, the minion has only the transform component. To process this data, we define a system where we specify the components we want to fetch. For example, the movement system needs to modify the transform component and the velocity component. The entities that have both are fetched and so moved. The advantage here is clear. The system code runs directly on all the components regardless of the entity final meaning, so with the same code we are moving three different things, the debris, the bullet and the character. The data is accessed directly, no extra overhead. But most important, at any given time, we always know the data we are accessing. This is what makes ECS a game changer, in my opinion. Since we always know which data a system is about to touch, we can execute any number of systems in parallel. These characteristics allow a gameplay system to be parallelized, while with object-oriented this is usually impossible or however really difficult to achieve, and at the same time not optimal. With ECS it's automatic and optimal. Returning back to the demo and by looking closely to the debris system and the random teleport system, it's possible to notice that those are operating on a different set of data so can run in parallel. It's fairly safe to assume that if run in parallel, the Godex demo could handle at least 1,500,000 entities. As I said, I won that Godex seems a good native module and the biggest challenge of my goal was make it usable in editor and with the Godot scripting. 
Let's create some debris. First, we have to create the component. We do it by creating a script that extends the component resource. So we define the velocity variable. Now it's ready to be registered via this button. So the component is displayed on the entities add component dropdown. It's time to create our entity debris, create a new scene and add the entity node. This entity should have a 3D world location, right? So let's add the transform component, it should have a mesh, so let's add the mesh component. And it must move like a debris, so let's add the debris.gd we created. Notice, we can choose debris.gd from the add component menu because we registered it. No system is moving our entity yet, so it's sad and stationary at center. To create the system similarly as we did for the component, we have to create the script that extends the system. The function prepare is called just once and it's used to initialize the system. We want to fetch the frame time data back, which is where the frame delta is stored, and then we want to fetch the transform component and the debris.gd component. The function for each instead is called for all the entities that have both the transform and the debris.gd component each frame. The code I have here accelerates the debris toward the center of the scene, making it oscillating around the center. The system is now ready to be registered as we did for the component. Now we can add it to the pipeline and move it to position 0. Make sure the pipeline is set as active and play the scene. The debris is no more stationary, rather it's oscillating around the sender. Add the entity node to the world is not the only way to spawn it. If you have a lot of entities to spawn, a much smarter way to do it is using the API create entity from prefab. Basically, it creates a new entity by copying the one you provide. See here, I am passing the pre-initialized debris entity. Then I fetch the debris.gd component from this entity to set the random velocity and then the transform component to set the random position. Press F5. This is Wonder, a game I am doing with Godex. Unfortunately, when I started working on this game, Godex didn't exist, so many classes are handled by the Godot nodes. Check this. The function physics process of this class handles the camera and other things. This function is not emitted by Godot, but it's emitted by the Godex system called physics process. In this game, this system is set on the physics pipeline, which is processed with fixed delta time, as you can imagine. But nothing stopped me to move it on the main pipeline, so the function physics process is called with dynamic delta, like the process function. I could even remove the system called physics process, so the function physics process is no more executed. Of course, it's the same for the physics. I can decide how to process it and if process it at all. Notice that I can fully customize the engine depending on the game needs at editor time without touching a single line of engine code. While this level of customization could be supported even using object-oriented, the mechanism that allows such feature would blot the code, while with ECS it's just a matter of add or remove a system. The same principle applies to the game code you write. The more you add features to the game, the blot it becomes. Even with small games, it's easy to notice that the classes became more and more intertwined each other, resulting in a code which is difficult to maintain, and in some cases it's even more convenient to rewrite with the new features in mind. With ECS, you code the game in small and really contained systems. The systems are never wired to each other, rather they transform the data. With the addition of more functionalities, the code base instead to grow vertically, it grows horizontally and flat, keeping the code simpler and easy to maintain. Most of the time, add a new feature means just add a new system, or in the best cases add a component to an entity, so using an already integrated system. See this, the bullet shot by this gun are entities. Let's say I want to change their behavior so they bounce around like this ball. Nothing more easy than this. I just have to change the component to make it move like the ball. With object oriented, usually change the type of a node is not so easy and you have to make sure all the features relying on the API of the previous type are still valid. 
The bullet shot by this gun travels from the muzzle to the first hit location. This is a multiplayer game. Look how convenient is the separation between data and functionality. On client, I want that the bullet shot by the gun, each frame, moves and performs the collision check to know when it hits something. On the server, instead, I want that only the position is updated. With ECS, all I need to do is compose two pipelines, each with different set of systems, one for the client and the other for the server, so I can load the one that I need. With object oriented, I would have to build a mechanism to handle it blotting the code. ECS is not for everyone, of course. If you are at the beginning and you want to just learn how to create games, it's not important to know. Indeed, one of the biggest challenges of using ECS is know and understand it. Object-oriented is immediate, you don't need to think out of the box and you can put knowledge you use to stay in the world, use it to categorize the object around you to create the game. While with ECS you need to think in a different way. While Godex works and the APIs are almost set, there are things missing, so my advice is don't use it. Unless you are someone that wants to look into a new technology or you even want to create a game to release and you are willing to help, as I'm doing. In this case, welcome on board. The benefit of Godex, among the other engines, excluding Unity Dots, is that it's good or baked, so almost everything is already implemented, like editor or asset loading. That's it! Enjoy your Godocon! Hello everybody, thank you for attending my talk. <clears throat> so today I will be talking about um, how we set up the dialogue system for our visual novel game in Godot, making Hama speak in Godot. And um, what you see here is the scene of our game, visual novel, and um, I will explain how, how we set these um, things up. And we are Senem Games. So uh, let me briefly introduce myself. My name is Senad Herniadovic. Um, I'm a software engineer and I live in Munich, in Germany. <clears throat> uh, my first job in game development I had at a local studio here in 2009 and we worked on a game called Dungeons. And uh, back then we, we still were developing custom ga game engine, um, component based game engine. And um, that helped me a lot when I started to use Unity 3D in 2012 um, for a side project I then had. And um, I had to look it up. That was still version 3.5 of Unity 3D. And um, so I've been using this game engine for a long time and I, I enjoyed it. also have enjoyed it a lot. And um, in 2018, I founded my... Um, Game, own game development studio called Senm Games, and we have been working on our debut title last year or in 2020. It's called Hauma, and for that, um, I, I, and we made the switch um, to Godot. And um, here's my email and Twitter handle, so feel free to reach out to me uh, anytime if you have questions. All right, so um, first of all, what, what is Hauma? What kind of game is that? So it's a visual novel, or we call it also interactive, interactive graphical novel. So it looks kind of like a comic book. This is the aesthetic we're going for. It's about a former policewoman. She's called Judith. It is fully voiced. And um, so we used Godot 3.2, and we also used um, Ink Engine, which is um, like for an uh, engine for interactive narratives, which is also free and open source from Inkle Studio in, in the UK. And I will show you quickly, I'll just show you quickly the um, announcement trailer so we can get a feeling what kind of game this is. Judith, you can run. But you cannot hide. The prophecy will be fulfilled soon. Listen, 
These people are powerful. I will close this case. My case. The bone has chosen. They found Nazi artifacts in there, but nobody talks about it. I've been searching for answers for months, but here I am. I'm back. Open up. This is the police. Stay away from him, sweetheart. He's just doing the dirty work here. What is this? A, a, a cult? Now, when have you heard that? Ms. Marvelous. What ritual? We will meet, Judith. We will meet. Alright, and moving on. So why did we choose Godot? Um, so there's a lot of reasons. Some of them may be a little uh, well well uh, thought through. Some are maybe a little bit superficial. I don't know. Um, but first of all, it's a non-profit organization. Um, it has a great community. <clears throat> I, I think it's also easy to use and has focus on usability. Um, I love the scene trees scene tree concept like once i got used to it i really love using gd script it's it's uh, for me a great language and i also had the feeling that it, uh, it was right becoming stable and mature enough so there's not like too many hiccups also the add-ons are important like we use one for um for ink and um also i had the feeling that for a 2d game it is really well suited because how much a 2d game so the dialogue system looks um, like this. It's um, quite straightforward with multiple choice dialogues. You see with the with the bubbles, and this is a, what we call a sequence. So we can also change how everything looks to like these custom images, basically, um, to make it look more interesting. So um, following up, I will explain to you how how we set up um, this in Godot. So the general architecture of, um, of of the dialogue system is this. Um, so the most important thing for us is that we have this um, separation between ink and Godot. And um, ink is a very powerful language. And our game designer, he can uh, basically write the whole gameplay, everything in ink. Um, there's variables and conditionals and uh, like it's almost like a own programming language, <clears throat> but it's um, so basically he most of the time writes in ink, and Inky is the editor, um, and he doesn't even touch the engine. So what he writes is basically like a text adventure, and then we take it and plug it into the Godot, and on the Godot side, basically um, it's like more of the engine. We don't have gameplay code um, inside the ink ink engine. So um, the add-on we use is InkGD, which is fantastic uh, work. It's like the whole Ink runtime was was rewritten in, in GD script, and the custom Ink API is something we um, another layer we added so we can have commands from and to Ink, but we can communicate. And basically, Pink Panther is also a um, command line tool we wrote so we can. <clears throat> generate um, correlation IDs for the lines in ink. We can generate CSV file, which is important so we can um, send out the lines to the voice actors so they can record those lines. All right, so um, what, what, is the, what is the custom ink API that, that we came up with? So basically um, there's two directions, like this is if from ink, our game designer wants stuff to happen in, um, in Godot, he can send commands, use commands, like for example, enter room or show a close up, show a sequence, and also trigger audio and stuff like that. So this is, this is, um, those two lines you see here. It's a command underscore and then the command and it can t also take arguments. But we can also trigger, for example, um, through the tags, which is an ink feature. You can have tags here. Um, for example, we can, through the character um, tag, we can we can switch the character portrait in um, in Godot. So this is more like an implicit command, let's say. 
All right. And on the other side, um, like we have hotspots in the game. When you click on a statue or you click on the motorbike, then some something should happen gameplay-wise. And what we do there is, like if you look at the ink code down here, the square brackets, it's the way in ink to have um, the, the multiple choice dialogue options. So instead of using it for dialogue options with a prefix, input underscore, um, like our coding Godot will understand that this is um, an input that's coming from hotspots. And this is a piece of code. It just goes through all the choices and um, looks for an input underscore with the command name that's associated with a hotspot. OK, and this is, um, is, is the implementation we have. Um, on, on our side, so this is the classes we use, um, just specifically for the for the dialogue system. So um, th the biggest and most important class is the dialogue system class. So what it does is, so we have a the ink engine is like another layer on top of the of the ink um, API, which is a little bit specific to our project. So we have things like um, commands and hotspots and close-ups here, um, which we implemented here. And um, for example, get next line will do some custom logic that we need in there. And the uh, dialog system just pulls the next line to get the string line. And there's like for our game specifically, we have four different types. Of, um, of UI. So we have it for a narration, for close-up. We have one place in the game where we have overlays on where Judith speaks, but she's in the scene, basically. But the most important one is the dialogue output and also the biggest one. It's like when you see the two portraits or even more, and they, they talk with each other. So for this case, we have the dialogue output class. <clears throat> it's a start and end dialogues. Then it will bring up the UI and, and, and hide it. And um, it like it can show choices if the user can um, select something or just show the next line. But also it can start um, sequences. So during the dialogue, um, like you saw it, when Judith gets angry, there will be a sequence and um, the bubble will be in a different image, let's say, not in the standard um, um, UI where you see the two portraits. And then for each, for the speakers or portraits, we have a speaker output um, where you can set the mood and you can hide the bubble and st stuff like that. And then for the speech bubbles, like we have eight or nine different speech bubbles, different sizes. They can be thinking or, or speaking. So there's some logic here, depending on the text and depending on the text, to select the right speech bubble. And the audio engine gets triggered from different places, depending which kind of um, dialogue UI it is, and it will play the voice over or stop it, like if, if the um, user press, clicks the mouse button. All right, so to look at a little, little bit of uh, different parts of this, so this is um, how we set up the speech bubble. Um, in the engine, you can see here the tree, and you can see there's a bubble, and this is the, also speech bubble script here. But um, I'm sorry, but underneath you have now um, the sprites with the images for the different bubbles. Each one has a um, different sized output label, and basically um, the code will go through this and select the appropriate one, and also make sure that that one is visible, the others not, and hide it, show it, stuff like that. And this is what we call the dialogue output. So this is like the standard dialogue when you have two um, characters and um, the active one will be a little bit lighter, the other one a little bit darker, and um, there's some animations. So it's a lot of state keeping basically happening there. And um, so this is the, the part of, the, of that scene, which is the dialogue output. And we have the buttons group, which is when you have the multiple choice. And um, basically, um, we have um, for the character, we have the, this background and the portrait, basically. 
and we have the animation players to fade it in and this overlay half one is to make it a little darker okay and then we have through more three more um, types of uh, dialogue outputs which are handled in the in the big class dialogue system class so we have a narration output which is the one in the in the box up here <clears throat> and then so these two bubbles basically the one in the background is for when we are in close-ups and the other one is for the overlay where Judith is in the scene and, and she's speaking in the scene and this is um, specific for our game so it's pretty tightly coupled to our to Hauma basically um, but you can see like what we did here in the scene so so we have it here different notes for narration close-up and overlay outputs and um, they have each their own bubble object okay and then um, we like like uh, I already mentioned we also have the um, story sequences and basically what we do here is we have a sequence and then we can have any amount of steps so in this case we have one two three steps and um, each of these steps is normally um, full screen image and um, but we can also have different ob objects here for example we can trigger um, audio like a sound or change of Munich uh, music like is here in the third step and um, we can also have speech bubbles so the once we get to the last step um, this guy is called Charlie then there will be a speech bubble so we're very flexible to have um, different kind of like so it's not always the standard dialogue view so we can have also um, dialogue like or the people speak in the in the sequences and we can also have multiple people with multiple um, bubbles in there and once the last line is um, finished belonging to the sequence it will leave this sequence uh, which can then go back to the dialogue view or maybe to another sequence and this can all get, be triggered from inside the ink script all right and then um, Pink Panther this is our tool we wrote and um, the reason we wrote it because this is not um, it's like ink doesn't have support for any of this uh, maybe you will notice pink has the word ink in it and we have here four lines of text from the inscripts and what it does is um, we like this correlation IDs here they are generated so our tool ge generates the unique IDs for each line and then it writes them out to a um, CSV file comma separated uh, values and basically from here we can just um, like export the lines we need to a PDF or whatever and send this to the voice actors and they can also hear um, see if you did do this angry or thinking or um, instead of angry it could be any any kind of text whatever um, our author want, wants them to know like how to speak the lines and basically what then uh, happens is that we get from the voice actors the recording and our en audio engineer he will um, separate it and split it and he will uh, then write it out here to files like this and the files they have the the character in there and the correlation id and then from godot when we need to trigger um, a voiceover we, we can um, we can get the correlation id out of the ink script here and we get also the character and then we look for um, the appropriate file this is how this works and um, we also want to add the support for um, localization to this tool but we, we still have to do that it's not in there yet all right so the conclusion um, Godot was great for us it worked really really well um, we, we're happy um, we, we chose Godot for this um, there were some problems but they were all solvable um, so I say it's it's minor problems um, for example um, using tweens or using animation players um, I 
I prefer to use animation players because I wanted to be able to do um, all the UI in the editor. But there was some kind of bugs for the for the speech bubbles, so eventually we have to move to tweens. Um, then if we have multiple layers, I mean to fade them out, fade in, it doesn't look very nice. Um, I think this is supposed to be solved in a good of four, I think. Um, Another thing that was really important and really helpful, and it made our game designer very happy, was the split between Godot and Ink, because he can do basically everything in Ink. And also the interface between Godot and Ink um, was important. Then writing the tool, Pink Panther, was super important and helpful, um, because it made it made the whole um, voice recording process quite smooth, basically. Um, so what we would like to do is like the the code we wrote in Godot, which is like kind of like a narrative engine. We would like to clean it a little bit up, make the um, interface between Godot and Ink better, and also hopefully, um, if we have if, like after we work on other titles, it would probably become more general, not so much tightly coupled to Godot uh, to Hauma. I'm sorry. So um, I think then that would be a great opportunity um, at a later point to also open source it and, and so more people can use that. Yes, and um, that brings me to the end of the talk. This is how we set, um, set up the dialogue engine um, for Hauma in Godot. And um, thank you a lot for listening. And I'm, I'm happy to answer um, the questions you have. Hello everyone, thanks for taking part in this year's Godot.con. Even though this year it's entirely online, uh, there seems to be a lot of excitement about it and the team made a great job pulling everything together. So well, let's enjoy it. I've been working for a year and a half on Godot 4.0, mainly on the rendering area. Uh, I'm closing to completing my tasks. A uh, few features are remaining, but currently focusing mostly on optimization. So I wanted to share with you what was done and what to expect from this new version, uh, especially in the rendering area, which is what I've been doing most of my progress. The first I want to talk about is Vulkan. Vulkan is the new open standard rendering API. It gives the programmer very precise control on what the GPU is doing, and it's very efficient at it. Godot 4 abstracts Vulkan and other similar APIs on different platforms into a new singleton called rendering device. Uh, unlike Godot 3, this singleton gives you full access to rendering uh, to an API that is similar to Vulkan in features, but is designed to abstract other ones like Metal, DirectX 12, uh, WebGPU eventually, and of course console APIs, uh, which isn't something we can't legally do, but other companies are porting Godot to consoles and they will be able to port it more easily with the, this new API. One of the nice features from rendering device is the possibility to create multiple instances of it and use it from your own game logic. Uh, while those instances can't draw directly on the screen, uh, you can use them for very high performance tasks, such as crowd simulation, simulation games, sandbox games, strategy games. Many types of games that require a lot of uh, computing resources can be very easily made with compute because it can process like tens of thousands of things at the same time very efficiently. Godot 3 uses a forward renderer for most of its rendering work. We have chosen this design over deferred renderings because it gives you more flexibility at the time of rendering. You can do a lot of really cool things like customizing your shaders uh, more efficiently. Uh, you can also mask a lot of objects like one object against another, an object against the light and different things. Uh, so in general, uh, it's, it's just more flexible for whatever you want to do. The idea is that you just do everything you want to do in Godot and don't find limitations. So uh, cluster forward rendering is the best approach we could find for that. There are plans eventually for creating a cinematic renderer for Godot 4.1, which will use ray tracing and all the modern features, uh, but this is a bit farther away down the road and not a priority for Godot 4. But just letting you know that this is something we're going to work with eventually. At the core, the main difference between Godot 3 and Godot 4 is that the later utilizes a forward clustered renderer. 
The clustering process splits the screen in cells and stores the likes visible on each one, making the rendering process more efficient as it happens entirely on the GPU. This approach allows for hundreds of lights on screen at very little performance cost. You can keep adding them even with shadow maps and you're going to have very little performance impact. This, together with other features, will hopefully allow for very large scenes with a level of content similar to the many current popular commercial games. This new technique also adds the benefit of being able to have not only lights, but decals in very large quantities in a level. Decals work like stamps that you can use to insert additional detail in levels, details such as mud on the floor, graffiti on the walls, or anything you can think of. They have several options to control how they are applied and allow overriding channels such as albedo, occlusion, roughness, metalness, normal mapping, or even emission. This can be done individually, giving you a large deal of freedom to add detail to levels. On the CPU side, the render has been massively optimized, with ongoing work by contributors to make sure your game is never CPU-bound on the renderer. Rendering in Godot now makes use of threads heavily to ensure the smallest amount of time is spent before submitting graphic commands to the GPU. Okay, so let's talk about post-processing. There's a lot of very interesting things going on in here. The first item, which is one of my favorite new features uh, and developed by contributor Clayton, the sky shaders. Sky shaders allow creating any kind of sky procedurally, so you can do anything you want with them. You write the shader once, uh, and Godot takes care of generating all the internal work, like rendering the background, rendering the radiance cube maps, the radiance cube maps, and everything required to, to do the reflections. Because updating those cube maps in Godot with a GGX approximation is so fast, it can be done pretty much in real time, allowing complex skies that can blend between day and night. You can have moving clouds, you can have complex layering systems for weather, yeah, and you can have other reflections and glow illumination that will update instantly when you change the settings. Sky shaders have other great features that I hope you will eventually discover yourself, but I have many more things to talk about, so uh, let's go to the next topic. Screen space ambient occlusion has also been completely rewritten from scratch, also by contributor Clayton. Godot now uses the S ambient occlusion from Intel. Yes, it's called S ambient occlusion. This implementation is optimized in compute and has fantastic quality and performance. And some great features like detailed AO, which is significantly improved realism by making complex surfaces appear less flat. Unlike the previous ambient occlusion, the new one has a much more consistent range of quality settings. They can be easily changed to achieve different performance and quality trade-offs. This means that if you're running on a lower end GPU, you can lower the quality. And if you're working on a higher end GPU, you can raise the quality, but they will still look about the same uh, with more or less quality. The depth of field effect has also been greatly improved. Uh, while the one in Godot 3 was pretty cool already, it lacks quality. Uh, the bulky filter was square, which isn't very realistic, and the transition to near field was just a fade, so it didn't look good. In Godot 4, the depth of field has been completely rewritten from scratch. By default, it supports hexagonal bulky, uh, which is really fast and looks really good. But if you're willing to spare a bit more GPU power in the high quality settings, of course, uh, the circular one looks great and very photorealist. The new Glow has also seen a makeover with more customizable levels, a normalization option, and a new mix mode, which makes it much easier to obtain the bloomy and dreamy feeling that goes great with many types of aesthetics. The fog effect has also seen a makeover. It has been greatly simplified with a more standard parameter set based on density. The fog also now supports aerial density for properly blending with the sky. Additionally, you can overwrite to the fog built-in 3D shader parameter, allowing you to create custom fogs with full artistic freedom. But that's not everything. Godot 4 supports volumetric fog, allowing you to see the rays of lights from the sun and the full volume of positional lights. Shadows are fully supported for all of them, allowing for a high level of fog customization. Volumetric fog can also play together with the global illumination. It can read light from it and it looks really cool because all the fog around the objects gets the color of the lights. This colors the fog in a much more realistic way. On the shader side, the biggest change is that sampling options are no longer specified in textures but on shaders. This gives users more freedom, helps improve performance and makes the limit of texture you can use on modern hardware virtually infinite.
but there's also more. Shaders in Godot 4 support global and per instance uniforms. Want to change the global settings that affects all shaders, like the wind speed for trees and grass? Yes, you can. It's very easy to do now. All shaders can access global uniforms, including visual shaders. Once you get familiar with this new feature, I'm sure you will find a lot of uses for it. But that's not all. Per instance parameters are also supported. Want to change the color of a tree in a forest? In Godot 3 you had to create a material override for just tweaking that. In Godot 4 you can just expose the uniform as a per instance uniform and the settings to tweak it will appear on the node. Okay, there is a lot to talk about and I really can't cover all the new topics, so let's talk about global illumination. Godot 3 had two ways to achieve GI light maps and voxel contracing. The light map implementation was expensive and quite poor, uh, and voxel contrace was very limited. It supports dynamic lights, but they have delay and no dynamic object support exists. In Godot 4, everything was remade from scratch. The new light mapper bakes on GPU, so a complex thing can bake in a few seconds. Spherical and monic light maps are supported, and they look really good. Additionally, there is light map probe support for dynamic objects. Light map probes can be placed manually or they can be generated automatically on the scene. Godot 4 supports an incredibly large amount of light map probes, although it can take a while to pre-process them. But if you just don't move them from bake to bake, they won't get pre-processed, so it's okay, don't worry. Godot, Godot 4 also supports the GA probes, which use voxel on tracing, but unlike Godot 3, this technique runs much, much faster. This finally allows you to use it on integrated GPUs. Additionally to this, the new light probe supports dynamic objects. You can just move them around and they will affect the illumination settings around them. Still, light maps and GA probes are limited to small areas. GA probes can scale better if you have a large level consisting of multiple large rooms, but neither of them is really useful for large open world games. To solve this, Godot 4 introduces a new type of glow illumination called SDFGI. This is a new rendering technique that allows for GI on worlds of any size, including infinite procedural levels. It is a bit more expensive than the others, but I'm hoping to optimize it further. It looks really good though, supporting real-time GI and even SDF reflections. This gets you closer to ray tracing quality without requiring that kind of specialized hardware. The best thing about SDFGI is that it's an instant on. You just toggle it on and it just have GI immediately. Unlike techniques based on voxel color tracing, SDFGI can also mix up interiors and exteriors without light leaks, as long as there is a wall thick enough, of course. The 3D particle system has also seen an overhaul. GPU particles work in compute now and they are very efficient. Among the new features supported are subemitters. Particles can emit more particles in a secondary particle system. This sounds really weird, but allows for trail effects, smoke, fireworks, etc. Collisions are also supported. Basic shapes like spheres and boxes can be added to the scene and particles will dynamically collide with them. For interiors or objects with more complex shapes, SDF-based collision shapes are supported. Just set the resolution and bake them from any mesh. And finally, high field collision is also supported. This creates a height map automatically from the whole world and can even update it as you move, allowing for effects such as rain and snow collision or simply for particles to bounce against the terrain. So I'm pretty sure you want to know more about model importing. Uh, model importing is going to be rewritten also in Godot 4, uh, but you have to wait a bit more to see it. It's in progress. Okay, enough about 3D. I know a lot of you really want to hear more about what's going on with the 2D side of Godot. First, the renderer is a lot more efficient than before, thanks in part to Vulkan. But there are many, many new features actually. Lighting has seen a makeover and has become a lot more efficient. In Godot 3, the more 2D lights you put in the scene, the performance would degrade very quickly. In Godot 4, everything is done in a single pass, so performance is really fast. So talking about lights, Godot 4 also supports directional 2D lighting. This was a common request by users working on 2D platformers. Just drop the node and tweak the direction and the height and shadows are supported. 
The 2D material system has also been changed with the addition of canvas texture. Canvas texture is a new type of texture that includes texture layers for normal, specular, diffuse, etc. It allows you to make more complex 2D lighting. Another nice feature of Godot 4 in 2D is the addition of canvas group, allowing you to treat a group of nodes as a single one. Applying an effect to a group of nodes has been always frustrating Godot 3 because it applies individually to every node, and if you want to have everything together, like having an outline for a group of sprites, or just making everything transparent at the same time without seeing through each of them, uh, well, that's something that has been annoying for a while. In Godot 4 with canvas group, you can just solve this problem. Canvas group renders all children nodes into itself and then renders itself into the screen. This allows you to apply any effect that happens on the final compositing of all of them. Another very requested feature that was just implemented was the ability to clip children to the nodes. Any node can work as a clip outline to any other node. Just enable the property in the inspector and then all the children won't be able to draw beyond this parent. So there are many more 2D features coming from other contributors including the new tile map editor and many other editor improvements. But remember I am mostly working on the renderer myself. Still there is this last feature I want to showcase. This is the SDF for 2D. 2D shaders in Godot 4 can access the screen SDF. This gives you an approximate distance to any occluder polygon around. Having this information allows you for a lot of cool effects from particle collisions, long drop shadows, or even 2D global illumination. So this has been everything up to here. I hope you enjoyed this preview. Now is the time for questions.